Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we'll be starting off our first summer, summer digital series today uh, on the Queen Strength uh, Zoom channel here. And today we're going to be going over the joint by joint approach and the ramp warm up. Uh, so at Queens, we have on average eight to 10 hours of coaching a day. Uh, and that lets us have a big opportunity for running a lot of warm ups. So hopefully we can uh, share some of our experiences with you to help improve your warm up and uh, make it a little more effective. Okay, so uh, the goal of this weekly series, uh, we'll be hosting one of these uh, every week, Wednesday at 1 p.m. And uh, we're just hoping to uh, break down and discuss some different training principles, ideas, and methods for everyone, and uh, hopefully provide you with some tools and knowledge uh, you'll need to design your own training programs and uh, try and just explain the why behind what we do here at Queens. So to start off, uh, we'll go over the joint by joint approach. So this was a concept popularized by Mike Boyle and Gray Cook. Uh, so if you don't know, Mike Boyle is a legendary strength coach out of Boston, trains a lot of Olympic athletes. <clears throat> and uh, Gray Cook is a physical therapist and uh, one of the um, uh, co-inventors of the FMS, which is the functional movement screen. So the joint by joint approach is basically a guide to help us determine what joints need to be mobile and what joints need to be stable. Um, so as I go through and explain this, um, one thing to note is we still want full control over all of our joints and we want the ability to produce a full range of motion at each joint throughout our body. <clears throat> so to get into this, I'll start by um, defining mobility and, and stability. So uh, mobility, we can define for the purpose of this lecture as the ability of the joint to move freely in an unrestricted manner and through a full range of motion. Okay, so you can see the person in this picture here has pretty good mobility at their hip joint to be able to do a squat like this. And stability, we can define as the ability of the joint to maintain position while motion takes place elsewhere. Uh, so in other words, we can say the joint's ability to resist force to motion on. <clears throat> so I'm missing the NBA right now. So we got a nice little picture of LeBron here and uh, we'll break down the joint by joint approach. Okay, so we can start at the bottom of the body. So in this case, we'll start with the foot. And uh, the joint by joint approach states that a stable joint will always be followed by a mobile joint afterwards. Okay, so in this picture, we have a stable foot. Okay, so the foot complex needs to be very stable and strong. And above that, we have the ankle joint. So the ankle joint, we want to be nice and mobile. And as I said before, we still want control over our ankle. So we don't want it to be so mobile and flimsy that it's just flop around everywhere. We want to be able to control that range of motion, but it needs to be mobile and uh, allow us to move through a full range there. As we keep moving up, we go to the knee joint. So we want the knee joint to be nice and stable. From there, we'll move up to the hip. Okay, so we want a nice mobile hip, allows us to, uh, to go through any movements we need there. And as we move up, we'll go to uh, the lumbar spine, which is our low back. Okay, and we want that to be nice and stable. From there um, to our thoracic spine, which is our upper to mid back. If we want that to be mobile, that's where we'll kind of rotate through, extend and flex through. Uh, so we want the movement in our, in our back to come from that area. I'm um, going from there, we'll have a stable scapula. And uh, if you don't know what that is, that's just your shoulder blade. So that's in the back of your body. So we want that nice and stable, followed by a mobile shoulder. So when I move my shoulder, I don't want my shoulder blade coming up off my rib cage. So we need that nice and stable to provide uh, mobility to our shoulder which means we can do anything with our arm that we need. Uh, as we continue down, obviously we'll have a stable elbow, mobile wrist, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so why is this important? So the joint by joint approach is important um, because we can see here in this one research study uh, where they taped athletes ankles and put braces on athletes ankles, something that a lot of athletes do all the time in sport. Um, we can see a 4% decrease in their vertical jump height uh, with ankle taping. So this was a study done with 30 varsity athletes from the University of Utah. Um, so a decrease in vertical jump height with ankle taping and a 4.6% decrease in vertical jump height uh, with the Sweeto ankle brace, which is the one in this picture here. So this shows that reducing mobility of the ankle joint had an adverse effect on performance. Okay, so that ankle joint, which we want control and mobility over, um, if you reduce that mobility, you'll see a decline in performance. 
<clears throat> and also in this other study, uh, they took a bunch of individuals who had ACL injuries and individuals who didn't have ACL injuries and they measured their ankle dorsiflexion. Okay, so the ability to have that tibia move forward um, as it would in like a squat. <clears throat> and they found that uh, the people who had ACL injuries in general had a decreased ability to dorsiflex their ankle. So less ankle range of motion. And in this other study done with junior elite basketball players, um, they followed them for one year. And on average, uh, the players who had reduced ankle mobility, so reduced ability to dorsiflex, um, had an increase in patellar tendinopathy or uh, knee pain. <clears throat> so uh, the joint by joint approach is important to understand because it allows us to pinpoint areas of improvement. So for instance, if we're running uh, warm-ups with our athletes, uh, we can see if they're not getting into the positions we need them. Say for instance, they're doing a body weight squat and we see that they aren't getting full depth. And then we can go and assess them and say, okay, is that ankle working properly? Do you have full range of motion there? Is the hip working properly? Is the, is the back, is the core stable, things like that. <clears throat> and in addition, it allows us to develop a framework for our warm-ups to best utilize the mechanics of the body and prepare for exercise, training, and sport performance. Okay, so now I'm gonna go over uh, why we would do a warm-up and our, our warm-up system at Queens. So warm-ups are often neglected, um, so it's important to do a warm-up uh, because we're trying to increase uh, physical preparedness, increasing psychological preparedness, uh, we're going to try and mitigate injury risk and we're trying to increase performance. So we want to be better at our workout or our training session practice game. <clears throat> okay, so we use the framework, it's called a RAMP warm-up. So the acronym RAMP stands for raise the heart rate for R, activate key muscle groups for the A, the M is mobilize key joints, and P is potentiate. And potentiate just means that whatever I'm doing now, has a positive effect on whatever I'm going to do afterwards. So for raise the heart rate portion, obviously we're going to want to raise the heart rate, but uh, other things we're looking to do is to have a progressive increase of body temperature, uh, blood flow, joint viscosity. And for our warmups, um, since we're doing them with the large teams and a lot of our sessions take place in the morning, we want to try and increase energy. So we have a lot of our lifts at 6 a.m. Uh, a lot of athletes come in, they're a little tired, so we try and bring energy and get them going. And for your warmups, if you're gonna do any foam rolling or self myofascial release, like lacrosse ball work, anything like that, you would do this before you got into the R portion of your warmup. Okay, so some examples you could do for raise the heart rate, uh, just jogging, skipping, uh, stair work, anything on the bike, jumping, jumping jacks, <clears throat> and any sort of fun games. Now, my fun games, I wouldn't get them into a complete 100% competitive game of like tag, um, obviously, because we're just starting our warm up. Uh, so we want to gradually get that intensity going. But a game I like to use is just rock, paper, scissors. Uh, we have a nice strip of turf at Queens. So if you lose your rock, paper, scissors game, you got to go down to the other end and back, either a nice light jog, some karaoke, skipping, things like that, just to get the heart rate up. Now, the raise the heart rate portion can be sports specific or general. So for instance, if I'm working with a football player, the raise the heart rate portion might be uh, going through some of their route running at about 50% speed. Um, if I'm working with a basketball player, it could be some dribbling, some light shooting, things like that. Um, and this works for any sort of client. So we work with athletes at Queens, but if you're a personal trainer and you're working with uh, an older client, you could definitely have them warm up on like an elliptical machine or walking on a treadmill, things like that. <clears throat> So moving on, A stands for activate key muscle groups. Okay, so we're looking to use low level exercises to activate some muscle groups here. In general, we're gonna wanna activate the glutes, the core, the upper back, shoulders, and the lower limb complex. So the ankle, the calf, things like that. Uh, so this is important as we wanna gradually increase intensity. So instead of having our athletes just show up to the gym, they're cold, not ready to go, and then we get them in the squat rack or doing sprints, this allows us to try and build some intensity and uh, warm up those key areas that we'll be using. So some examples here would be uh, single or double leg glute bridge variations, mini band walks, any sort of plank variation, front plank, side plank, dead bugs. And if you're lucky enough right now to have some bands with you, you can do some band pull parts, some face pulls, or some good old fashioned push-ups. <clears throat> All right, so moving on to the M. 
So to mobilize our key joints, uh, we're going to be using that joint by joint approach, right? So we know that the ankle needs to be mobile and we know, for instance, the knee needs to be stable. So I'm not going to try and mobilize my knee joint. So we want to focus on the ankle, the hip, the thoracic spine, and the shoulder. So that's going to be our, our key area for, for mobility within our warm up. Okay, so some exercise here, any sort of squatting, lunging, uh, T-spine rotation, sideline windmills, hamstring sweeps, knee hugs, knee cradles, that will all work the mobility of the ankle, the hip, the T-spine, and the shoulder. So here I have just a little example here, world's greatest stretch. I'm sure plenty of you have seen this. Uh, this is one of our former interns, Josh Britton. So he's gonna go through here and we'll talk about this as he goes. So he's pulling his knee up, working on a little bit of hip mobility. As he raises his arm, we're getting a little bit of shoulder mobility and uh, mobility at the hip with the hip flexor. He's gonna rotate through. So we're getting some T-spine rotation at our thoracic spine. He's rocking back on the hamstring and then he'll switch sides. Okay, so we get some hip mobility, some lunging, working on the hips, working the shoulders, working the thoracic spine here as we rotate through, okay, and then the hamstring. So this is a great stretch to do. Now, you're probably thinking lunging and squatting also activates areas, and yes, it does. So that's why the A and the M portion of the warm-up you can kind of do together as one. So what I like to do is, obviously I want a nice flow to my warm-up. I don't want it to be too abrupt on the ground, off the ground, on the ground, off the ground. So I like to start with uh, my lunging and squatting, some bigger full body complex movements there. I'll take it down to the ground, do my glute bridges, um, do some upper back work, do some push-ups or some uh, core activation, and then I'll bring it back up to standing, and then I'll get them into the next portion of the warm-up, which is potentiate. So like I said before, potentiate just means whatever you're doing now has a positive effect on what you're doing afterwards. Okay, so our focus is to choose exercises which will have a direct link to performance on subsequent exercises by utilizing something called post-activation potentiation. So post-activation -activa potentiation, or PAP, just means that we're trying to excite as many muscle fibers as possible so that the subsequent exercises we're doing um, can have increased performance. So for instance, if I was going to squat during my workout, I might do some jumps or uh, some sprints during my potentiation phase to try and get me ready for those squats. <clears throat> and alternatively, if I had a squ uh, sprint heavy workout, obviously I would do some lighter sprints, uh, maybe some jumps, some bounds, some leg bounding, things like that. And then during the potentiation phase of the warm up, we're looking to increase intensity so we have a seamless transition into the workout. So <clears throat> if I was doing sprints during my workout, my buildups of sprinting and bounding would lead directly into my sprinting at the start of my workout. Uh, we're also looking to prepare the individual or team for intensities they will engage in during the training session. So if I was working with uh, a team who was about to play, so it's game day, obviously you're going to want to do a warm-up that gets them ready for the game. Alternatively, if you're in the weight room, uh, you'll be doing a warm-up that prepares them for the intensities they'll see within the workout. So if they're squatting heavy, if they're benching or deadlifting heavy, if they're sprinting or jumping, we want to get the body ready for those activities they'll be doing. Okay. And we also want to have a purpose and increase our energy and get getting ready to go. So if I was doing, say, bench press during the workout, I wouldn't want to do a bunch of jumping. I might want to do some med ball throws. Um, and in addition, like I said, we work with large teams, so we want to increase energy and get a good atmosphere in there. <clears throat> so some exercises you could do for the potentiation portion, just short to medium accelerations, about 10 to 15 meters. Uh, some band resisted sprinting, some light sled pulls and pushes. So uh, sometimes you might uh, hear a sled called a prowler. Uh, so prowler pulls or pushes, um, any sort of jumping variations or bounding um, and any upper and lower body plyometrics. This can include uh, like poco jumps, um, plyometric push-ups, things like that. And of course, medicine ball throws if you have those available and the space available to you. Uh, so overhead med ball throws, med ball chest passes, uh, things like that. So that would all fall under the potentiation portion of the warm-up with the hope that that will improve our performance uh, in the next portion of the workout. Okay, so we're going to break down ramp. Um, so how long should this take? 
sounds like a lot of stuff. The R portion of the workout should take about three to five minutes. Um, that'll give you adequate time to get the heart rate up, the blood flowing, just get the joints moving a little bit. And the N and the M portion, we're looking for four to eight exercises for each section. So um, four to eight exercises of activation, four to eight exercises of mobility. For example, we're looking to mobilize our ankle, our hip, our T-spine, and our shoulder. So that would be our four exercises. And then our potentiation would be one to three exercises to kind of get us fired up and ready to go. So on average, it should take about 15 minutes. Um, if you're in a hurry, you can kind of crunch this down to three minutes uh, to raise the heart rate, and then four exercises for each day in the M and one exercise to potentiate. And you might get away with about 10 minutes, eight to 10 minutes for the breakdown of the warm up. It's important to do, it will increase performance uh, throughout your workout or whatever you're planning to do here, whether it's a game, practice, training session. <clears throat> so in summary, understanding the joint by joint approach allows you to target areas of the body to work on. So like I said before, if you notice that your hips are a little bit tight during the warm up, you might spend a little more time warming up and mobilizing your hips. Um, if you're feeling uh, a little unstable, you might spend a little more time activating your core, providing some stability to the body. And utilizing the ramp framework for our warmups ensures you have a complete warmup to prepare you for your workout, training session, or sport. So thanks for watching. Uh, join us next week. We'll be discussing training principles and how to apply them to your workout at home and in the gym. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to throw them into the chat. Thanks. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Oh, we got one. Oh, we're good. All right. Okay, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Stay safe, and I'll see you next week. Bye.